just a little bit of curiosity for me. Why, why are you here? Why did you decide to spend a good hour of your day? And I was Coming told to by us. my manager that I had to give a presentation to the department. And my first thought was, no problem. I certainly wasn't a manager. I was just a systems developer, and I had to present this concept that we had. And it was my first serious exposure to having to give a presentation. And when I got up there to give it, some terrible things began to happen. I first started to lose my vision. Everything started to look blurry to me. Then I noticed that my hands began to shake. And I decided to hold a piece of paper, and it was worse because the whole piece of paper was shaking. Then I noticed I began to lose the sensation in my knees. And I was afraid I would ac ab actually collapse. A and I've heard of that, where people actually fainted and collapsed having to give a presentation. So my first exposure made me realize <laughs> there's a problem here. I've got to figure out what I can do because I knew in my job I would eventually have to give more presentations. And I actually, at that moment, began to panic and told myself, I'm never speaking again, even though I knew I would have to. Now, for me, there was an additional problem. I discovered through some workshops and personality tests, I was an introvert. Right? Any introverts here? Raise your hand. Okay, there's a few of you that are willing to admit it, if you are. And so I, I read an interesting book called The Introvert Advantage. And in the book, it says just being around people can be overstimulating to, in, to an extrovert. us introverts. Gets their energy from other people. We love to be around other people, right? If you're an extrovert, you love to be in front of a crowd. You love to be at parties. And you don't like it when it's over. The extrovert actually gets their energy from other people. An introvert doesn't work that way. We get our energy by being alone. We can only take things in small chunks and pieces. And then we have to go away and process. So then, over the years, I realized I would have to give presentations. I said, I am really in trouble. How am I ever going to get over this, this challenge that I have? I like this quote. It's one of my favorite. The human brain starts working the moment you are born and never stops until you stand up to speak in public. <laughs> Show of hands, how many think it's true? <laughs> right? That's why you're here. It's an incredible challenge. We can be the smartest people. And you can work on a presentation. You can work on a speech all you want. You can work on a project presentation, but when you get up and give it, you lose everything. It just You fall apart. You forget about what you're going to say. We rely on notes. That's why we read. That's why what people do as a crutch is they create a PowerPoint and just read from it. It's easier, but that's not a top-notch presentation. And I'm going to show you more about what is a top-notch Most of us, we spent our childhood being told to sit down and keep quiet you, you do what I say, you speak when I tell you to, right? I know I'm exaggerating, but in, in, a, in a, a big way, that's how we were raised. So you know what happens? And first of all, before I go on, anything I say here is not to fault our parents. Our parents did the best they could with what they had. They did the best they could with what they knew at the time. All right, so let's get that out of the way. So our parents bludgeoned us into behaving, into sitting down and not speaking uh, until we're told to speak. How about the old style methodology or the old theory about children should be seen and not heard? Okay. But the problem is we took that into our adult life. And most of us today are still wait, walking around waiting to be told what to do, waiting to speak when we're told to speak up. And we've not learned how to shed that. They would stand in one spot at the front of the room. They almost had their back arched, like, no, I don't want to take up much space. They would talk quietly. They would rarely go over the rules and develop consequences. They would say things like, is it okay, could we please open your books to page 32? Asking students permission. What, we, what was required in, in what we proposed is that instructors need to learn how to take back the classroom, learn how to take up space, how to move around and talk so that the students could actually hear, and to take charge of the front of the room. And you know, that's no different than what I'm telling you here, what some of the things you're going to learn. When you're the presenter, be the presenter. 
get in the front of the room and take up space. Take charge. Let your audience know that you are the presenter. Whether you're doing a 10-minute project update in a department meeting or you're doing a full presentation, take charge. There's no secret to that except you've got to shed the feeling of, I'm going to wait until someone tells you're me. You're all judging me right now. You're looking at me. You're listening to me. And so we know that because we're an audience often, right? And we sit in the audience and go, I can't believe she wore that today. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe that. What a, what a dumb PowerPoint. You know? We judge oftentimes. We don't mean to, but we do. We're actually comparing what we see, comparing it to what we would do. That's what we do. We're human beings. We're weird creatures. So you know that you've, you've taken the time to sit in an audience and judge. So when you get up there, you know you're being judged. So it almost it's intimidating. And the other one is speaking and thinking is actually, actually a juggling act. It is. It's taking a thought, processing it, and delivering it through your speech. Audience and it's a feeling inspired, thing. thoroughly informed, or motivated to take action. How you do it is up to you. We all have our own styles. We have our own abilities and skills. However you can achieve that, it's up to you. So here are some reasons why I believe we need to have top-notch presentation skills. One is to feel comfortable speaking because whether you like it or not, you're going to have to do it. We are human creatures and we communicate verbally. One of the many ways we communicate is verbally. You're going to have to do it. And I'm not talking about being a professional speaker. I'm talking about picking up your telephone, answering questions when your boss walks into your office. Somebody stops you in the hall, you have to communicate. And you know what? That's when you actually project who you are, the way you communicate, the way you speak. Another one is the desire to be believable. I want, to, I want folks to know that when I talk to them, I am sincere, I am real. What I have to talk about is important, and that requires the ability to be believable. Also, the development of confidence. You know, once you learn to get up in front of your peers and speak and you start developing the, the confidence to do it and go, hey, I can do this stuff. This is cool. This is cool. I'm learning this. I'm getting over it. It's actually a gift. You now take that confidence anywhere you go, in your job, in your personal relationships, in, in the things, the, the projects you work on. That confidence goes with you when you learn to master being able to speak in front of others. And finally, avoid wasting time. I don't want to waste my time or yours. You, you've given me one hour of energy to develop presentation skills, even if I never spoke in front of a group. I'd rather be prepared and never have an opportunity than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. Lack of presentation skills, if you don't know what to do, if you're not sure how to present, and that's why you're here, to learn some presentation skills. And finally, if, you, if you're a disorganized person, if you have the habits of disorganization, it's going to be difficult for you to get up and speak in front of a group. I've broken this thing down into three areas, three specific areas. The first one is visual, what people see when you're talking. First one is your stance and your movement. Notice I talked about Caitlin's stance before, to stand firmly on both feet. The things that I don't like to see is when a speaker is like balancing on one foot. You ever seen that? They're balancing on one foot, they're standing like this, and they're fidgeting around. I went to a presentation the other day and there was a female speaker and she had heels on and she took a heel off and she's rubbing her, her, her nylon toe on the floor. <laughs> What do you think I was looking at and paying attention to when she was doing that? Her foot. There, the chances are good that whatever she was talking about when she's playing with her toes, I've missed. And why? Because it creates a distraction. A lot of the things I'm going to show you here today are all about how to not create a distraction so that they truly listen to what you have to say. Movement should be gradual and across the whole room. This lady here, this gentleman, are part of my presentation, just as the folks on that side of the room. So my challenge as a speaker is to work the room, to move back and forth as much as I can, because I want everyone to feel engaged in a part of my presentation. That requires gradual, non-distracting movement. Now, men usually tend to put their hands in their pockets, right, because they're there. These appendages are really strange. We don't know what to do with them when we're feeling nervous and we're speaking. 
women oftentimes put them behind their back and do what's called the reverse fig leaf. <laughs> you ever seen it? Some people do the fig leaf, right? And if you do this, it creates a distraction. The other day I went to a presentation and the, and the speaker was doing the peeking fig leaf. <laughs> right? And, and it, I, almost thought, I almost thought I was going to go. Yeah. You know, it just it creates a distraction. I, I am being silly. But I'm being silly, but the point is it creates a distraction. You don't want to do things that are going to draw people's attention to what you're doing. And your hands is one of the things that can probably do that. I also encourage people not to hold things in your hands if you don't have to, unless it's a microphone or index cards, even a sheet of paper, you can do that if necessary as well, if it's a part of your presentation. But you want to try to minimize what you're doing with these hands, and it feels weird and awkward. The best thing to do is leave them right at your sides. Use them in your presentation. So the only thing that I'm holding here is the control for the PowerPoint, which I have to hold. So I'm trying to use my hands in my presentation. That's what you want to do. When you make a point, use your hands and your movement I'm into talking, But I'm thinking right now. And I'll have the next thought in just a moment. So hang on. Don't, don't talk over me. It's also a way to stall as we get the next thought. going to use quotes in your presentation. Tell your audience who said it. If you, if you truly don't know, go find out if you can. I know there's a lot of anonymous quotes out there on the internet, but do your homework. You'll look like a more credible speaker if you use a quote and say where it came from. Like I did when, in the beginning of the presentation, right, with George Jessel's quote. Use qualification. The second one, if you use cartoons, I know it's done all over the place, I don't think it's really against the law, but it is considered unprofessional plagiarism to take a comic, a comic, put it in your PowerPoint, and not and get permission to use it. I work with parents in teaching them discipline. I specialize with inner city families. It's one of my passions. It's what I talk about. And so I use a lot of parent training. I, I speak to professionals in the education field, and I have comics. But what I always do is I go to the artist, the writer or the publisher to get official permission, uh, written permission that I can put in my file to show. And when I have it on my PowerPoint, it says in small letters, reprinted with permission from the author. Or I even state exactly who the person is or where it came from. So that's a, a, a suggestion. Music creates atmosphere. Did you notice when you walked in, was, was music playing? Okay, I want to create atmosphere. I want to create excitement. I want to create ambiance. I want to create an atmosphere that says you're about to learn something great. You're about to sit through a, an exciting presentation. The next one, number four, is engage your audience. Find ways to actually engage them through questions, through exercises. You're engaged right now with filling out the outlines, correct? I engage you by looking for volunteers. A presentation is a partnership between an audience and a speaker. And the better speakers use that and develop it. And the last one, start and stop on time. If you go to a presentation and the speaker is supposed to speak for 15 minutes and they're now speaking for 25, where's your attention? On the clock. You're also now thinking, oh my gosh, is the other speaker going, following this person going to lose 10 minutes? Or is this thing, it works, is this going to run over? Am I going to miss my next meeting? Am I going to be late for lunch? Right? How about when you go to church and the pastor's over his hour? You're thinking about the football game on TV, dinner's in the oven, guests are arriving. The whole point is, as soon as your speaker goes over time, you're checking out. Your audience is checking out. And the funny thing is, the speaker stays up there and speaks. They think everyone wants to hear what they have to say. Because again, we get locked into our head. We get locked into our body, and it's hard for us to break out to pay attention to other things. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to bring the hand out. Well, if you didn't tell us, we wouldn't know. <laughs> right? It's what I call showing your underwear. Don't show your underwear. Don't show things to people they don't need to know. So don't apologize. If you didn't, if you didn't bring the hand out, if you didn't bring a prop, go without it. No one will ever know. It's your secret. Okay, so I'm always asked about PowerPoints. People say, okay, great, yeah, that's presentations. But I want to know about PowerPoints. I, the first thing I always tell people is the tools selected for a presentation are less important 
than the presenter being confident, organized, ready, and skilled. But a lot of, some people disagree with me. You know why? Because they use PowerPoint as a crutch. If I have a big flashy PowerPoint, then I don't have to worry about my presentation skills. It still shows. We know it still shows. So anyway, here are 10 tips that you can use with PowerPoint. Number one, talk to the audience, not the screen. When you're going to speak to the audience, Try to face them as often as possible. Now, you will find you'll have to turn around and face the screen as you're reading bullets or points, but turn back around and address your audience. Number two, slides should be a supplemental. Okay, They should be your supplemental part of your presentation, not your main presentation. If you show up and it's your first moment using equipment and something fails, you're going to look like an inexperienced disorganized, unprepared presenter. So show up ahead of time and practice with it. Because again, you don't want to show them your underwear. Don't show them that you don't know how to use the equipment. The next one is save complex diagrams for the handouts. Don't put these giant complex maps on the screen and expect people to see them. If you're just putting them there for show and tell, then put it on paper so if they can you take it with them. don't remember anything else I've told you here today, these are three very important points. Know your material. Find ways to develop your skills. And finally, practice, practice, practice. Practice your talk, if even if it's two minute in a project status update. Again, when you get up in front of a group, whether your boss is there or not, it says a lot about you. If you use care and powerful presentation skills in your presentation, it says that you care about your material, you care about your work, you care about your project, you care. And the only way you're going to get that is by practicing as much as possible. What I usually do is gather some friends together and say, how about, can I get something on the Outlook calendar, 30 minutes, and I want to do my talk in front of you. And I pretend that they are going to be my audience, and I practice my talk. And then when I'm all done, I say, okay, let me have it. What did you like, and what should I work on for next time? I get look that and I find people who have something I want. And then I spend a lot of time with them as much as I can. A mentor is something you do on your own. You find someone who's a great speaker, you want to be like them and say, can I take you to lunch? Can I buy you a coffee? And what I try to do is once every month, once every two or three months, I'll sit down with them and say, teach me something, anything. What's the most powerful skill you can give me right now? And I try to have mentors in different areas of my life even as a husband and a father, I use mentors. People who have shown me and the world that they're good at something they do and I use them and I want them to teach me. And nine out of 10 times, mentors My final quote, old. developing the winning edge, and this is a great quote from Brian Tracy. Small differences in your performance can lead to large difference in your results. By taking the time to develop your speaking skills can lead to great things over your lifetime. And somebody said, was walking with me said, oh, don't go. They make you get up and talk. <laughs> I said, thanks for saving me. And it wouldn't be for another four years before I'd ever go to, to the meeting. And that kept me away. They did a great job. But I think about how much more I could have actually conquered or accomplished in my life if I had gone a lot sooner. So I appreciate your time for coming out here. And after my applause, I'll take questions. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs>